Good morning and welcome to church. My name is David Gunger. Um, I'm going to lead us in this call to worship, if you would follow along. How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are called to be Easter people. Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Let us sing together this morning. I was looking for some shelter, just a little bit of shelter from the Everything was helter-skelter I was starting to swelter From my pain From my pain I never took it seriously But you move mysteriously, Lord Look who I mountain on me when they finally down the bottom
A reading from Psalm 107. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. again open my heart blossom into future graves with love blessed be the mystery of God be still now my soul the scriptures been written and love will not fade, death won't remain, all will be one. Blossom into future, grace with love. Blessed be the reality of God. Be 
not afraid Home's not a place It's found in you Silent voice Deep in my soul You're finding me Blessed be the mystery of God I'm still learning to love And fully be human To bring all I am Be born again Open my heart Blessed be the humanity of God All are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class, gender nor sexuality, politics nor religion, personality nor nationality, count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos, our hatred and our indifference, Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. The birds they sang at the break of day start again. I heard them say, don't dwell on what has passed away, or oh, what is yet to be. The wars they will be fought again, the holy dove will be called again bought and sold and bought again the dove is never free ring the bells that still can ring forget your Offering, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. We ask for signs, the signs were sent, the birth betrayed, the marriage spent the widowhood of every government signs for all to see 
I can't run no more with this lawless crowd while the killers in high places say their prayers out loud they've summoned up they've summoned up a thunder cloud they're gonna hear from me ring the bells that still how the light gets in That's how the light gets in You can add up the parts But you won't have the song You can strike them a march But there is no drum Every heart, every heart to love will come, but like a refugee, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering, there is a crack, a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in, that's how the light gets in. You shall cross the barren desert But you shall not die of thirst You shall wander far in safety Though you do not know the way You shall speak your words to foreign lands and they will understand You shall see the face of God and live Be not afraid I go before you If you pass through raging waters In the sea you shall not drown If you walk amid the burning flames You shall not be hung If you stand before the power of hell and death is at your side Know that I am with you through it all Be not afraid I go before you
blessed are your poor. For the kingdom shall be theirs. Blessed are you that weep and mourn. For one day you shall laugh. And if wicked men insult and hate you all because of me. Blessed, blessed are you. Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come, follow me. And I. Would you join us in our generosity prayer? Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May it be true of our community. At this time, we say grace and peace to one another as a blessing. Take time to bless those who are with you now, and perhaps to send a message to someone in your heart. Grace and peace to you. Good morning once again. Welcome to Good Shepherd New York. My name is Michael Rizzina and I'm one of the pastors here. Today on this second Sunday of Eastertide, it's my joy to introduce to you our guest preacher, Sarah Bessie. Sarah is a dear friend of our community and is the author of many best-selling books, including her most recent work, Field Notes for the Wilderness, Practices for an Evolving Faith. She's also the co-founder of the Evolve Gathering, and is uh, just a beautiful and powerful voice for this moment, especially for those who are coming out of uh, evangelicalism, exploring new theological and church terrain. Uh, she today reflects on the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 24, and it is the story of the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you are walking along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day 
since all this took place. In addition to this, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came, they told us that they had seen a vision of angels and said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow you are to believe the prophets and what they've spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, and they said, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with them, us on the road, and opened the scriptures to us? They got up, they returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven, those with them, assembled together, and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, everyone. Well, as you have heard from our gospel reading, I want to talk about a small story involving Jesus. And of course I do. Um, since we're still in Eastertide, this story actually fits right in with the church's focus right now. Um, but I wanted to actually begin with three words um, that quite broke my heart in this passage that we just read. Uh, there were a few things, of course, that caught my attention in that reading. Um, definitely got a little bit snagged on the little line there that no one believed the women. Uh, imagine that. And then, of course, the idea that Jesus wasn't recognized until um, they were all at the table together. There's something really beautiful about that to me. So there's a lot of directions that we could have gone. Um, and yet there was something right around verses 20 and 21 where Cleopas spoke these three particular words to Jesus and his companion seemingly nodded along. It was when he said the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And there they are. Those are the three words that broke my heart. We had hoped. We had hoped. Maybe they had hoped that Jesus would redeem Israel. Maybe they had hoped that he would be their great liberator, that he was the Messiah that they've longed for. Maybe they were hoping for more great words and deeds. Maybe they had hoped to overthrow the Romans and hoped for redemption. And maybe there were a lot of them that were hoping that Jesus was going to talk himself out of this one because he, he did that sometimes. Maybe they were hoping that the triumphal entry just a week ago had meant something. Maybe they had hoped that Jesus would somehow stay alive, but he's dead and his body's missing and rumors are swirling. And now what? In his commentary on the book of Luke, Justo El Gonzalez notes that even the possibility of resurrection is not enough to wipe away their sadness. They're disappointed because they expected certain things of Jesus. And so apparently they're sad, not just because Jesus has died, but because he has not met their expectations, he said. We had hoped. To me, this might be the wilderness that many of us are experiencing right now at this moment in time. Sure, there is, there's a lot of anger and there is grief and there is sorrow and fear and sometimes even some confusion, but there's also disappointment. There is our thwarted hope. 
You know, Proverbs tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And perhaps that's what I was hearing in those three heartbreaking words we had hoped. It's, it's heart sickness. When I think about the stories of so many people that I have encountered through my work, um, not only obviously, you know, in places like yours, but, you know, through Evolving Faith and through over all these years, people who have, you know, deconstructed um, their faith or experienced the loss of faith, um, a sense of disillusionment. Um, I've always really liked the phrase evolving faith, obviously. Um, but I see this. I see this disappointment that we had hoped, that we had hoped that the people who introduced us to Jesus wouldn't be deceived by Christian nationalism or conspiracy theories, that we had hoped our marriages would survive, that we had hoped for healing, we had hoped that our friendships would last, even as we changed or transformed, we had hoped that the whole church would love the LGBTQ folks and the immigrants and widows and poor and incarcerated and disabled and neurodivergent. We had hoped that if we raised our kids a certain particular way that we could guarantee an outcome. We had hoped that purity culture would give us a healthy view of sex, but boy, what a nightmare that turned out to be. We had hoped that our parents would love us unconditionally. We had hoped that the church that claims to be you know, pro-life wouldn't be pro-gun and pro-war and pro-death penalty and anti-refugee, let alone shelling out 69 bucks for a Bible to pay for legal bills. We had hoped that our elders would be who they had taught us to be. We had hoped that our lives would look different than they do. We had hoped that our prayers would be answered in a particular ICU in Nashville. We had hoped that we could ask big, meaty questions without pe making people shut the door on us or call us heretics. And we had hoped that we could bring our whole selves to church. We had hoped that the gospel would be glad tidings and good news for everyone. We have hoped for justice. We have hoped for so many things. We have hoped. And many of us have found ourselves in this sort of wilderness, friends. We found ourselves on that road to Emmaus. And maybe we haven't even admitted entirely that we are heartsick and disappointed and profoundly, deeply, devastatingly disappointed. Jesus hasn't met your expectations. Or maybe, maybe it's simply those who claim to follow Jesus. And I do think, you know, for what it's worth, I think that it's good and worthy work to interrogate our expectations of Jesus. Sometimes we are a lot more like the disciples who expected one particular type of Messiah and got the crucified Lamb of God instead. So that's good work to do. Sometimes our expectations need to be disappointed in order to make room for that true and wise and good gospel to disrupt us. So maybe you feel that disappointment. Maybe you don't. And that is entirely fine, too. Um, most of us do find ourselves there at some point in our life. And so if today is not your day, then please know that all of us here rejoice with you in that. Um, you can just maybe tuck this one into your back pocket and hang on to it for when maybe a day will come and the spirit will remind you to pull it back out again um, on a day when maybe you do need to be reminded of it, that we each have, of course, you know, a different story and we're at different points in our journeys, not that it's linear anyway. But one of the great lies that people will tell you is that if you were more faithful, you would not have found yourself in the wilderness or in any form of disappointment. But I believe that instead, oftentimes we find ourselves here not because of our faithlessness, but because of our faithfulness. So let's bless that, shall we? That we're here because we dared to hope. We, we took it seriously, didn't we? You dared to hope that the gospel was true. You dared to hope that Jesus meant what he said and that God was love. You dared to believe that the church could be a sanctuary for the wounded and the misfits and the marginalized. You dared to hope that we were all made in the image of God. You dared to hope that prayer changed things. You dared to hope that you would be loved and that you could love in return. You dared to hope that Jesus' teachings and way of life would matter more than politics or power, that truth and goodness mattered. You dared to hope for friendship and for justice and belonging and for shalom. You dared to hope for, for peace. And so here we are, fools on the road to Emmaus, 
together. We are bringing our heart sickness and our disappointment with us. We've heard of resurrection, but we're not even sure what that means yet, or if we believe it. And yet, were not our hearts strangely warmed when we were on the road? We might ask each other later, maybe. You know, on the days when I believed this, that's a phrase that my friend Rachel used to say all the time whenever she would talk about these stories. On the days when I believe this, right on the road, right in the middle of our despair, in the dust of our disappointment, maybe, perhaps, I think we're walking with Jesus in ways that we cannot even recognize yet. And remember, too, that the two disciples were not afraid to speak out loud to this stranger on the road the realities of their situation and their feelings. They weren't afraid to admit that they were sad, that they were disappointed, um, that their hopes hadn't come to fruition in the ways that they had hoped or expected. They were confused and they didn't pretend that away or pray that away or sing victorious worship songs in the middle of it. You know, you can grieve the friends that you've lost. And you can grieve the dreams that have died and the ideals that have become a bitter reality. We can say with a lot of faithfulness that the women tell me there's resurrection, but I'm just not sure what I believe now. And there will be those around us who will say that we walked away from Jesus, but instead, here he is on the road with us. We simply don't always recognize him. And as they walked on that road, Jesus spoke to them about how his suffering was part of the story. He spoke to them about the scriptures and the prophets and the path that led him there to that moment with them. Their hearts are warming. They are rekindling unlikely hope even before they can name it, even before they recognize him, even before the bread is broken. So I wonder if there is room in your hope, if not for resurrection yet, then for the companionship and guidance of the spirit as you travel. You can be walking with Jesus, feeling like your hope is dead, and the whole time God is alive and walking alongside of you with patience and kindness and love, kilometer by kilometer, hour over hour. I know that I do talk and write a lot about hope. Um, That's on purpose. And it's not an empty or a naive thing for me. Um, We have fought and contended. There's an old word I still love, contend. We have contended for hope because we've suffered. And who among us hasn't grieved? We've had our certainties blown to hell, and it turns out that God was the one who lit the match. The God who suffered is the same God who calls us to hope and walks alongside of us. Your defiant, scrappy bit of hope that you still hold And that you are tending like a campfire in the dead of night tells me that you are not done yet. The fact that you are even here tells me that some little spark, some little pilot light um, of hope resides in the furnace of you. And I'm not talking about the stupidity of silver linings or um, the violence of everything happens for a reason or privileged optimism. Listen, I've always been a silver linings finder. This is not that. I'm not talking about the anemic idea of pretending everything is fine or, you know, it'll work itself out in any way, yay for heaven, or um, what Kate Bowler calls toxic positivity, right? Because I see something so different in our Jesus. Not just the Jesus in this story, but Jesus' entire life and ministry and ongoing work in the world today and the entire story of scripture and, and in my own life. When I look at Christian hope, I see hope that takes suffering and grief and injustice seriously, that takes our liberation and our joy and our flourishing seriously. This isn't dismissive or a pat on the head platitude. We don't live and move and have our being within a love that denies our full humanity. Your hope is defiant. However small your little light, it is resistance. It's this middle finger to the forces that seek to colonize and steal and kill and destroy. It's the knowledge that Jesus came to give life and life that's more abundant. And that does not mean faking it till you make it. You wouldn't have found yourself in the wilderness if it wasn't for your hope. Your hope is rooted in your grief and rooted 
in your anger and your despair and your sense of betrayal and your suffering. You won it. You worked for it. You earned it. Your hope deserves your honor and your love. You are still on the road to Emmaus. We're all moving towards the table. And the great truth that Jesus has been with us all along. Your hope turns over tables in the temple. Your hope is how you vote and march and protest, or as John Lewis used to say, make good trouble. Your hope is never giving up and never backing down. Your hope isn't sit down and shut up. Your hope shows up for the lonely and the needy and the sick and the stranger. Your hope notices and prioritizes beauty and joy and is what is making room for you in rest and in Sabbath. Your hope is singing songs and cooking meals and braiding the hair of children and writing poems. Your hope is planting gardens in the very places of your exile. Your hope is what brought you here to the feast in the wilderness. You hoped you weren't alone and here we all are together. And maybe it isn't the optimism or the naivete of our old lives. And so trust me when I say that, that's a mercy in the end. Because this, this is hope that has seen a few things. This is hope with lines on her face and silver in her hair. This is hope with steady arms and steady feet, rooted and planted and grounded and anchored in the love of God. This is hope with a raised fist in protest. This is hope crying out in the streets and hope feeding people and showing up with bruises on her knuckles and fire in her eyes. Hope showing up knowing full well that she will be disappointed again and even that knowledge doesn't scare her. This is hope that rises every morning and makes the coffee and keeps freaking going. Jesus on the road is the living embodiment of what we're yearning for here, that deferred hopes and disappointment, that grief and sorrow and suffering and injustice. It's not the end. They're real. And they're not the end. They're not the last word or the biggest word, let alone the only word. Love is more real than any of it. And on this road, we journey with Jesus. So don't surrender your hope just yet. Don't let them take it from you. You contend for it. Bring it with you, even if you're traveling on roads you know or roads you don't know. Tend to it, even if you are leaving behind toxic beliefs and habits and spaces that don't bring flourishing to you or to the world. You know, at our first Evolving Faith gathering, Rachel said that an evolving faith isn't one that's like superior or further along, I wish. It's just a faith that's adapted in order to survive. And hope is like that too. Let it adapt and change in order to survive. The story of us, of all of us, and the story of scripture tells us that hope does not disappoint in the end. You may be disappointed, and that's real. But your hope, your hope in the goodness and the welcome and the love of God, you wonderful, stubborn thing, it will not disappoint you. You can take a risk on hope like that again. A longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And then Revelation tells us that the tree of life, its leaves are for the healing of the nations and the renewal of all things. We're all still walking towards Emmaus and our hope is with us, however battered. And soon our eyes will be opened to who is walking us home all along. Now, may the God of Emmaus and all disappointed disciples meet with you on this journey. May you acknowledge and bless your heart sickness, confusion, and grief and anger in the presence of God. And keep moving towards the table. May you tend that little spark of hope that is strangely warming in your heart. May you treat that with honor and with love. May you cultivate hope in the wilderness and experience both companionship and unexpected resurrections together as a community. Thanks for letting me be part of it today. Amen. And now that we've reflected on the gospel, we take a moment to declare our faith. This is the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we've declared our faith, we offer our prayers. These are the prayers of the people. Join me now in the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray this especially for Israel and Palestine and for our own country. We pray for reminders of our common humanity to be constantly grounding us in a place of compassion for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Bless all whose lives are linked with ours and help us to see the interconnectedness of all things and all people. Lead us to actions, words, and thoughts that promote truth and peace and help us to love one another as you love us. Remind us of our shared pain. Remind us of our shared humanity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. God who hears us, we pray that you hear the cries of your people in Israel, Palestine, and around the world. We long for peace. We pray for an end to the misery and suffering. Give our leaders the courage and imagination to look for the unexpected, the alternative, any way forward that leads us back to our humanity and makes way for the flourishing of all. And meanwhile, as our world is flooded with news, images, and stories of so much suffering, we pray that our hearts do not grow cold and unfeeling. May we grow in compassion and love, and out of compassion and love, may we grow in courage and action. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died. For those who died in pain, Lord, have mercy. For all people who died in fear and terror, Lord, have mercy. For families who have lost their children and for children who have lost their families, Lord, have mercy. For every innocent child who has been lost to violence, Lord, have mercy. May all who have died be comforted by your eternal peace in the place where there is no pain and suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now having prayed our prayers, we make space for confession. Would you join me in holy memory, considering the week behind us, the ways that we've fallen short of love, and ask for God's help to hone in on a memory that matters. And remember, it's God's kindness that leads to change. So if there's any image of God right now that keeps you from soberly looking at your life, simply discard it with every exhale. And with every inhale, receive afresh the tender mercy of Jesus Christ. Friends, know that you're not alone. Whatever memory is coming to the surface of your mind right now, they come to all of us. And so right now, I invite you into this ancient and corporate confession. Would you join me in this? Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry and we humbly repent. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, friends, hear the good news, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward you, and as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. You're loved and you're included and you're forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to this table. Again, this table which tells us there is no distinction, that there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, Republican or Democrat, gay or straight, black or white, all the distinctions that we create. Jesus obliterates through his mercy and love and inclusion. And so we come to this table and we ask God to grace us once again. And we begin with gratitude. So would you join me in this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is good and beautiful to say thank you. And right now, we hear our own hearts and voices lifting up with the angels and archangels of Isaiah's vision, who say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and cup and he blessed them. After he took the bread, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this body, which is broken and given. May we be broken and given for our world. Amen. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance, remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which points us to the way of forgiveness and reconciliation and truth. Amen. And now, friends, we declare the mystery of faith. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God. Amen. And now, friends, we invite you to receive Holy Communion. Our practice is an open table. Any drawn to the love we see in Christ are welcome to come. Let this be a gesture of your open heart to receive the love that you find there. And our practice is typically to take the bread and dip it in the cup. Let us receive Holy Communion together. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us once again at Good Shepherd New York online. Happy Eastertide. And this is a season of joy. It's a season of celebration. And we celebrate together what we began during the season of Lent, this My Good Shepherd invitation. We're trying to strengthen our community as we make decisions around the future of our new home. And we've set two goals that you can participate in. First is a capital goal, $300,000, helping us transition swiftly, smoothly, securing a long-term lease in another venue. And I'm happy to say, excited to say, that we're more than halfway to our goal. Today we stand at $173,995 of that $300,000 capital goal. If you'd like to make a donation to this uh, fund, it is a one-time offering. It is above and beyond your normal commitment, financial commitment to this congregation. And you can do so by texting Good Shepherd NY to 77977 and simply select My Good Shepherd in the drop-down fund. We're looking for 100% participation. So if you call this church home or if you're blessed by this ministry and you'd like to help us finding, with finding a new home, you can make a contribution online. You can also make uh, contributions via donor advised funds or stock uh, contributions as well. And all that information is on our website, goodshepherdnewyork.com forward slash give. The other way that you can participate is by building our long-term financial sustainability. 
and this is by joining the My Good Shepherd community. The My Good Shepherd community are people who give in a recurring way, who set up monthly contributions. It could be once a month, twice a month, but in any case, it is a recurring gift that helps us have visibility and it helps us have stability month over month, year over year. Our goal for this invitation is to reach 250 uh, members of this My Good Shepherd community. Uh, we started with 201 and we've jumped all the way up to 225, meaning we only have 25 more people to go in order to reach our goal. And if you call this church home and it blesses you, we invite you to invest in this recurring way. Uh, this is not set up to the My Good Shepherd Fund. This is set up to our tithes and offerings as it supports our normal operating budget. And so you can join us in both of these ways, uh, contributing to the financial strength in the short term through the capital goal or through the long term with the My Good Shepherd community. Uh, and in either case, we are so grateful. Uh, so many of you have already begun to uh, donate and to invest. And I have to say, as uh, as a leader of this community and as someone who is seeking along with our board and our staff to guide us through this transition, it is incredibly heartening, uh, not only to see your own generosity in the face of this challenge, but also to uh, read your emails and your letters uh, more than we can respond to at this time. Uh, but I hope to be able to respond to all of them. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for the rich community that God has created, uh, not only here in New York, but beyond New York and uh, your love and support mean the world to us. Uh, we need your prayers and we continue to ask for your prayers as we make decisions ahead. Um, we're gonna be hosting a, a, a conversation here on the 14th and we'd like to also be able to host something with you. So be on the lookout for uh, our plans to do that. Uh, we're exploring the best vehicle for that. Uh, but we'd love to share the values that are guiding us as we search for new space, new home. And we'd love to be able to share some of the options that we're considering on the table. Uh, we know that whenever you're raising uh, capital for a project, the more concrete you can be, the better. And as soon as uh, our negotiations start to mature, we will share with more detail uh, what the need is and what the opportunity is. And we are extremely grateful and thrilled about uh, what's on the horizon. And so be on the lookout for that very soon. And with that, receive this benediction. Now receive this benediction. Lord of mercy, be with us as we go from this place today. Fill our lives with your love. Help us to bring the good news of hope and peace wherever we go. Let us truly be people of the resurrection, the Easter people. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace. I'm closing chapters, I'm turning pages, glory to glory, from faith to faith, I'm moving on, I'm moving on, I'm moving on. I'm getting older, so I'll keep it straight, it hurts to let go. But hurts more to stay I'm moving on I'm moving on I'm moving on Hey, 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 hey. I know my fear you Can't compare to What God will do With my life And I am forgetting What's behind
She taught me well Forget your failures Forgive yourself I'm moving on I'm moving on I'm moving on Trying to move.